When NASA staff opened the hatches of Apollo 1, they were met by a truly harrowing sight. It's January 27, 1967, and the AS-204 spacecraft, which would become known as Apollo 1, sits ready for testing. It's a bit more than three weeks until the launch, and NASA plans to rehearse that moment here at Cape Canaveral, Florida. However, the three pilots on board are suddenly confronted with a test that they did not expect and which leaves them helpless. Those three men, Virgil Gus Grissom, who is in command, Ed White, and Roger B. Chafee are all highly experienced pilots. Two have already visited space, and soon the plan is for the trio to take off in the first mission in the Apollo program to carry astronauts. The module that they sit in is known as Block 1, a different design from Block 2, which would later go to the Moon. The plan is not, though, for this module to make a lunar trip. Its rocket should take it into low orbit of the Earth. It's an essential step in the Apollo program, the U.S. mission to put a man on the Moon. The name Apollo was selected by its head, Abe Silverstein, who believed the idea of a god riding through the skies in his chariot matched the size and scope of the initiative. The program was the third effort by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to give NASA its full title. To put men in space. Its aim was to meet the target set by President John F. Kennedy when he told Congress in 1961 that the U.S. would land a man on the moon by the end of the decade and return him safely to Earth. The aim of the Apollo missions was to send a cone carrying three men up into orbit around the moon and then back to splash down in an ocean here on Earth. The command module was a bit more than 11 feet tall and slightly less than 13 feet across. It came along with its own support module, which carried scientific instruments and an engine. North American Aviation had been contracted to build the Joint Command and Support Module and part of the Saturn V rocket that would lift it. Because of the way it had been designed, the module's own rocket was actually sufficiently powerful to raise it from the moon's surface. But this version would only be used for testing, with a later model featuring a separate lunar module. The men aboard Apollo 1 were highly trained astronauts. The command pilot, Grissom, had been involved in NASA's space mission since day one, becoming the second American in space and the first to go there twice. Indeed, the World War II veteran had been selected as one of the Mercury 7. Those seven were the first chosen to be astronauts in Project Mercury and were also known as Astronaut Group 1. Alongside Grissom was Alan Shepard, the first American in space, and other men who would all head for the stars when their time came. One of the men would pilot each of the manned Mercury missions, and the group would be subsequently used for Gemini, Apollo, and space shuttle missions. When it came time to choose who would be an astronaut, it had been decided that military test pilots would be the best group to source from. On top of that, astronauts had to be fit, educated, and curiously, no taller than 5 foot 11 inches. That's because the Mercury spacecraft could not fit a bigger guy. Selecting astronauts was a tough process, beginning with whittling test pilots down to the 110 who met the criteria. Months of testing followed, both physical and mental, with some tests akin to torture, including subjects having their feet frozen in icy water and suffering no fewer than five enemas. But the process winnowed out the best of a group of high achievers, with some of those rejected going on to be admirals. This Apollo 1 mission, however, featured two men who had not been in the Mercury 7. The first was White, who had a career not just as a test pilot but also as an aeronautical engineer behind him. He was an experienced astronaut, having been the first on a U.S. mission to step outside a spacecraft and spacewalk in 1965. White had piloted Gemini 4 on his June 1965 trip into orbit, and on that flight he'd made his exit from the spacecraft. He'd loved walking in space so much that he actually required ordering back inside. But danger had not been far away. A problem with a hatch could have been life-threatening had his partner not been able to shut it again. The third member of the team, Chafee, was lined up for his first trip in space. He'd been one of nearly 2,000 applicants to be part of the third astronaut group. Progressing through the selection stages, despite having abnormally small but very effective lungs, he was delighted to be chosen in October 1963. After selection, Chafee spent some time working on the Gemini 3 and Gemini 4 projects before being placed as third seat in the Apollo 1 mission. He'd once said, I've always wanted to fly and perform adventurous flying tasks all my life, and now he'd reached the pinnacle of flight. Now Chafee and the others were scheduled to enter space in AS-204 as the vessel was coded. The purpose was to check launch procedures and, once in the sky, try out the tracking and control for future missions. The plan was for the mission to take as much as a couple of weeks if it all went well. For the first time, the craft would carry TV cameras so the controllers could see its instruments. Flight Crew Operations Director Deke Slayton, who had himself been one of the Mercury 7, picked the crew for Apollo 1. 
Originally, he'd opted for Don F. Eisel as third seat, but he managed to dislocate his soldier in training, so Chafee substituted for him. By the end of March 1966, the choice was set in stone, and NASA shared it with the public. In June, the crew got the okay to put together an Apollo 1 mission patch, although it hadn't been decided whether the mission would carry the Apollo name. The crew themselves were responsible for its design, centered on themes that linked to the mission itself, with a North American aviation worker doing the art. The Apollo 1 module was way larger and more complicated than anything that had been built before. When the crew looked it over, they expressed some concerns about how much stuff that could catch on fire filled it, particularly Velcro and nylon nets. However, this may have been drowned out by other concerns, as engineering alterations bogged the project down. Tests continued, and changes were made in response to their outcomes. The craft edged towards being ready for takeoff. As the builders worked on smoothing down its rough edges, it was decided to make this the only crew test of the Block 1 design. Crews shifted around, getting set for the next stage of the program. Not everyone was satisfied with the craft's progress. One of the backup crew claimed to be uncomfortable with the ship, although he couldn't put his finger on what the problem was. He urged Grissom to bail at the first sniff of a problem, but Grissom would not allow fear to creep in. Indeed, the chief pilot said in a New York Times newspaper interview in 1966, "...you sort of have to put that out of your mind. There's always the possibility that you can have a catastrophic failure, of course. This can happen on any flight. It can happen on the last one as well as the first one. So you just plan as best you can to take care of all these eventualities, and you get a well-trained crew and you go fly." On January 27, 1967, the spacecraft was going to be tested plugs out. This made sure that it would work while set free from cables. The test would be a crucial step towards being launched on February 21st. It should be straightforward and perfectly safe. The spaceship would not be fueled, and its explosive bolts would not be activated. That afternoon, the three pilots climbed into the module in their suits. Helpers did up their straps and linked them to air and communication. Grissom reported a curious smell, and that had to be checked out before the test could go ahead. After a long wait, the countdown began again. The next stage was to install the hatch, which had three pieces. The inner hatch sat in the cabin, and two outer hatch elements lay outside. The furthest one was a piece of a cover for the whole module. It couldn't be fully closed because the one cable to which the module was still attached ran underneath it to a power supply. But once it was in place, the cabin's air was switched to pure oxygen. It became apparent that communications were poor, with Grissom's complaining, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings? The outcome was another delay as attempts were made to fix Grissom's microphone, which was permanently switched to transmit. In the meantime, the astronauts could be heard moving around in the cockpit, and a possible reason soon became apparent. The pilots once more went through the checklist that guided their actions. As they did so, there was a rise in voltage in one of the AC connections. A few seconds after that, an astronaut tentatively identified later as Grissom said something, and among the possible words that he used was one chilling possibility, fire. Suddenly, the horrified ground crew could hear the sound of the astronauts struggling to escape from the cabin. A voice, thought to be Chafee's, confirmed, I've or we've got a fire in the cockpit. Confusion reigned as the men tried to let ground control know that they were contending with a serious blaze. Some people later said that they'd been able to see white on the TV connection trying to get the inner hatch open as the blaze spread. Meanwhile, the cabin oxygen fueled what was now an inferno. The pressure rose rapidly, and the command module's walls broke open. Now the flame surged out onto the launch pad. The air rush that happened after the walls of the cabin were breached pushed flames into the whole cabin. But soon, it also put the fire out as it replaced the oxygen in the cockpit. Masses of carbon dioxide and thick smoke pervaded the cockpit, and as the fire died down, large quantities of soot started to coat the cooling surfaces. The pad's workers fought to get the hatch open, but it took them five minutes. Once inside, they could not find the astronauts because of the heavy smoke. As the air became clearer, a scene of horror presented itself. The three astronauts' bodies were stuck to the cabin, pinned by the melted nylon. When Slayton first looked into the inside of the cabin, he found a confused picture. He told an inquiry about Grissom and White, "...it was very difficult for me to determine the exact relationship of these two bodies. They were sort of jumbled together." It seemed clear that the three had followed procedure, but had not been any help to them. A huge investigation ensued, run under procedures set after Gemini 8 had failed in flight in 1966. Part of the inquiry involved breaking the spacecraft down into its component parts and checking each one. The investigations board also looked at autopsy reports and interviewed witnesses, eventually reporting in April 1967. The autopsies on the astronauts discovered that although their bodies were badly burned, that had not caused their demise. 
they all suffered heart attacks because of carbon monoxide poisoning. This had happened when the fire had melted the tubes that fed them air, letting in the toxic gas. The review board couldn't figure out for sure where the fire had begun. However, it did find a wire, coated in silver, whose insulation had been rubbed off by a door. This lay near a cooling line, which had previously sprung leaks. The coolant included ethylene glycol, which could react with the silver on the wire to create an outburst of heat. Wherever the spark had come from, it found the perfect environment for a blaze. The cabin had been filled with pure oxygen, creating a pressure in excess of five times more than that of atmospheric oxygen. The flight plan would have been to lessen the level of oxygen once in flight to drop the chances of a blaze while still leaving enough to breathe. The investigation found that there was no lack of stuff that could catch on fire. The cockpit was almost carpeted in Velcro, which would certainly burn in an all-oxygen environment. Some of the flammable material had been taken out when the astronauts had questioned it, but it had all been put back in before the test. Above all, when planning the test, no one had seen it as risky. Consequently, the equipment for use in an emergency wasn't up for the job of coping with this sort of blaze. There were no firefighters or rescue workers on site, and no medical personnel handy, and the area was cluttered, making access to the command module difficult. The Apollo spacecraft obviously needed a serious rethink. Now it was clear how risky they were. No men would fly in Block 1 spacecraft from now on, and Block 2 was given a redesign. In particular, the atmosphere in the cabin would contain much less oxygen until the craft had reached space. Astronaut suits were also rejigged with nylon, which can burn, replaced by beta cloth, which is not flammable and very hard to melt. And the inside of the cabin featured materials that would not take a flame. The hatch on the craft changed too, now opening outward within five seconds. In honor of the fallen astronauts, the craft was redesignated Apollo 1, the next as the fourth in the program would be Apollo 4, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin finally set foot on the moon. They laid an Apollo 1 mission patch on the satellite in the memory of the crew. Later, a plaque with their names and those of others who had given their lives in the quest to reach the stars was placed on the moon.